Welcome to the last day of our conference and for your attendance in, in Saturday. <laughs> Today we will have two panels. One, uh, um, okay. One of them, uh, miscellaneous, uh, which will include a presentation on animal boredom and another on boredom and video games, which is a topic I truly love. <laughs> and the other one will be on boredom and architecture. Uh, this one will be moderated by, uh, by our keynote, Andrea Pidoro. So later we will open our discussion panel in which uh, we will present the numbers of the conference and also we will bring back your unanswered questions along the, the conference and finally we ourselves will propose some other others to discuss before uh, through the end of, uh, of, the, of the encounter. And don't forget, please, that at the end of the day, we will be presenting the International Society of Boredom Studies. Very important remark. So please, remember that you have 30 minutes uh, to present and 10 minutes to answer questions, and that when two minutes are remaining to have to finish your presentation, I will press the right hand button as a, a kind reminder, okay? Uh, what else? Uh, oh, of course, you can ask questions at any time during the presentations by posting them on the chat box or, or just wait to the question time for, for to ask them out loud. So please keep your microphones off all the time. Uh, remember, you can you can activate your subtitles to easily follow the presentations in, in English. And now we can start, I guess, with the miscellaneous panel. So first, Marta Koronkiewicz, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, and Paweł Katzmarski from the University of Road Law in Poland will present a paper titled Beyond This Work, Boredom in Contemporary Games. So Marta is an assistant professor at the University of Road Law. She's a member of the editorial, uh, editorial team of Theoretical Practice, a journal on philosophy, sociology, and culture. Her main areas of interest are modern and contemporary Polish literature, in particular poetry, and the history of Polish leftist, uh, leftist literary criticism. From his part, uh, Powell is a doctoral candidate in this university. He's a member of the editorial, editorial team of the same journal. Recently, he's been working on the subject of literary autonomy in post-1989 Poland and the role of literary criticism in a market society. So please, the first yours. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll start uh, a talk and we'll switch a couple of times uh, in, in the next 20 minutes. Um, we should probably start by explaining that our academic background is mostly in literary studies, modern and contemporary poetry specifically, and our interest in game studies has been relatively recent. In fact, it is more like through boredom studies and the critical reflection, the relationship between boredom and meaning, that we've decided to try and include games in, in our research as another way of showcasing certain tendencies or processes that we first noticed in our work on literature, which is to say, apologies for a the very preliminary nature of our, of our remarks, but hopefully in the course of this short presentation, we will be able to demonstrate why we believe the relationship between modern games and boredom is an interesting object of research. Uh, meanwhile, let's start with a simple observation. Games, video games specifically, are increasingly boring. Arguably, the, the first notable game critic to point that out was Stephen Poole. Uh, who in his seminal 2008 piece working for the man against the employment paradigm in video games compared select popular video games to some of the most tedious forms of wage labor. Drawing on Adorno and Horkheimer, he posited that the games increasingly, quote, hire us for imaginary, meaningless jobs that replicate the structures of real world employment. In the following years, many critics, researchers and game designers picked up on the same intuitions. There are those like the influential crit games critic James Sterling who have been sounding the alarm. They believe that certain forms of boredom have become a default rather than an aberration in modern game design. Others like Alex Wiltshire, who's recently published an important piece about boredom in games 
in the influential British magazine Edge, or Ian Bogost, a well-known philosopher and game designer, have been more hesitant to make definite judgments and instead point out that various, often contradictory, types of boredom seem to coexist in games. And others yet, like Aurea Harvey and Michael Seyman of the famous indie studio Tale of Tales, have been experimenting with boredom that is intentionally evoked in order to express or reflect certain real-world feelings or experiences. Unsurprisingly, though, I guess, most critics and designers tend to see boredom in games as something essentially undesirable, at least by default. Games are supposed to be either entertaining or meaningful or both, and this seems incompatible with them being boring. When Richard Cobbett of PC Gamer makes a list of 11 most boring sims on PC, it is not to appreciate them for their say, charming quirkiness, but rather to drag them into the light as a sort of a spooky historical curio. And when in 2018, uh, Nathan Grayson of Kotaku openly admitted that getting bored and walking away is how most games end for me now, you can, you can see this in the title, it was a damning account of how games that are too ambitious in, sco too ambitious in scope tend to overstay the welcome. Among those critical of boredom in games, there's also a strong feeling that the problem is somehow getting worse. Though by many metrics, games are becoming ever more advanced and in a way sophisticated in terms of technology, but also artistic ab ambition, or even the number of people involved in the production. Uh, this often means more of the same old boring stuff uh, rather than some new interesting propositions. And it seems like the discourse on boredom in games has even crossed over into the mainstream. Just recently, Zoe Williams of The Guardian, who's probably as far from a game critic as one could be, wrote an entire column where she basically reiterates what uh, Stephen Paul had said back in 2008. Uh, quote, video games have turned my kids into wage slaves, but without the wages. Uh, and, although, and although Williams uh, begins by repeating what in the context of gaming used to be a list of very typical parental fears when it comes to gaming, uh, so uh, are my kids getting a, enough fresh air? Will they become addicted? Is this a useful life lesson to find meaning for shooting others and so on? She immediately clarifies what I'm actually worried about is that this is way too much like work. Task-driven, repetitive, monotonous, but immersive, often very frustrating. It's exactly like having a bullshit job. In other words, boredom rather than addictiveness, or maybe boredom in conjecture with addictiveness seems to nowadays be the new source of fears for a parent of a gaming child. All these are just a few examples of people with, from various backgrounds exp expressing interest in or concern about the increasingly palpable presence of boredom in modern games. But even if we assume that the games industry indeed has a problem with boredom, and that this problem is somehow linked with, to the very nature of the medium, it seems important to first point out that, co that causes of boredom in games are quite varied and often seem to have little to do with, on with one another. Provisionally, we could list at least five different causes of, or sources of boredom in modern games. The first cause, probably the most obvious one, has to do with writing, plot, world building, or a lack thereof. In fact, this might, this might just be the most widespread cause of boredom in games, which are often and not entirely without reason associated by, by the wider audience with cheap, simplistic writing and over, uh, overt reliance on various stereotypes and cliches. Obviously, these days, there's a vast selection of ambitious, well-written games to choose from across various genres and sectors of the industry. But still, compared to any traditional narrative medium, uh, medium on average, games come off as, uh, as um, putting relatively little effort into constructing a meaningful plot. The second source of boredom in games may be seen as closely tied to the first, but has to do, has to do more with the sheer similarity of various titles and the widespread popularity of certain conventions rather than the quality of writing and world building as such. In other words, games are not boring by themselves, but they become increasingly boring the more we play them simply because they all rely on the same old tropes, the same narrative conventions, the same ideas and topics. 
This source of boredom is often described in openly political terms. Games are boring because they constantly center a certain type of a hero, most commonly a wild heterosexual male. They only show typical romantic behaviors, they glorify violence, and so on. The third potential cause of boredom in games is the repeti repetitiveness of actions that are demanded of the player. In, the, in its most extreme form, this is sometimes called the grind, and is one of the, uh, of the forms of tediousness that both Poole and Williams seemed so concerned about. The players are asked to perform a series of identical actions that provide them with only a nominal sense of impact or, or purpose, but are arbitrarily required of them. If they want, for instance, to push the plot forward or unlock a new area of the game. This type of boredom has become widespread over the years, especially in high budget video games due to a business model adapted by the big publishers who insist on artificially prolonging the gameplay time as well as look for additional monetization opportunities by allowing players to skip for, for a fee certain tedious parts of the game and so on. Another source of boredom in games is probably most noticeable uh, whenever games are seen as nothing but a narrative medium. This is when the game is seen as a simple vehicle for a traditional narrative and the tasks set uh, set before the player, repetitive or not, are reduced to a set of arbitrary actions that must be performed in order to push the plot forward. Here the plot is di uh, divorced from the gameplay, the famous so-called ludonarrative dissonance, but the boredom stems not from the divorce as such. Rather, it is rooted in the li uh, linearity of the narrative and the arbitrariness of the constraint. No matter how interesting the plot, the actions we perform will still seem boring if, we, if they are perceived to have no impact on our surroundings. It's the why it's not, why isn't this a movie type of boredom. Finally, the fifth source of boredom in games is in a way the flip side of the previous one. It's the total lack of constraints, limits or structure. What games journalists usually describe as a lack of content. That might cause players to feel free to do whatever they want to, uh, to do whatever they want to do to the point of boredom. It's the sense that the game does not provide any resistance to our actions, either in the form of uh, reactions and commentary or challenges and tasks or a tangible measure of progress. It's the feeling that the world doesn't push back against our actions the way it does in real life. This is something we've been seeing more and more in very, uh, various sandbox style and open world games where the feeling of openness is often accompanied by a sense of emptiness, as if the ever expanding game worlds were bloated with empty space, devoid of interesting characters, objects or events, and the promise the game will eventually allow us to create our own stories results in complete apathy on the part of the players rather than some newfound enthusiasm for the media. This is arguably only amplified by ver uh, various technological advancements, the promise of procedural generation, for instance, where an entire universe can be created and recreated from a handful of pre-made blocks, is increasingly seen as a double-edged sword when it comes to games design. Now, if we are to pin down the source of cause of boredom that is somehow specific or native to games as a medium, we should probably first point out that some of these examples could be described in terms borrowed from other fields. The boredom of video game grind, for instance, a series of simple, repetitive and mind-numbing actions could very well be explained through an analogy to factory work and uh, Benjamin's and Adorno's famous comments on the modern boredom of uh, industrial proletariat. There are obvious important ca caveats to such comparison. First, games lack the disciplinary apparatus of the 19th century factory, and the work of grind is largely undertaken voluntarily. Second, insofar as games are not used to produce anything, they do not imply the same process of externalization and alienation as your typical uh, productive labor. 
but still it seems like this particular phenomenon could be seen as a new variation of an old trope. Likewise, the boredom that stems from the poor quality of the plot or writing or the world-building elements of the game could be seen as similar to the present in films or novels or other traditional narrative media. This is the boredom that belongs to the object or the work of art that we are confronted with as its audience. If a film or a book is deemed boring, it is because something in them seems boring, say a character or style or a certain formal choice. Just as the boredom of the video game's grind belongs solely to us, to our own actions, we are bored because for, for one reason or another, we do the same thing over and over, the narrative boredom is the game's own. We are bored because the game as an external object is boring. But even if we put both these types of boredom aside, there is still much left unexplained. Why, in the open world games, does the feeling of boredom so often seem to correlate with the sense of freedom, whereas in various other games, something exactly opposite is happening? If such games allow us to create our own stories, why is it so hard to master enough enthusiasm to actually do the creating? There seems to be something else at play here, another type of boredom that cannot be reduced to its older recognized and domesticated forms, either to the boredom of, the re of repetitive work or to the boredom of a boring plot. Um, a good example of this other form of boredom may be found in 2016 No Man's Sky a highly anticipated game uh, about space exploration that even before the launch drew significant attention from the mainstream media. Its lead developer, for instance, was even interviewed on Stephen Colbert's The Late Show. It promised hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of exploration in a vast procedurally generated virtual galaxy with a potential number of unique planets reaching up to 18 quintillions, each with their own fauna, flora, landscape, geology, uh, and other stuff like that. Although this universe was, technically speaking, shared by all players, due to the sheer size of it, each player was promised a completely unique experience, a long and organically evolving journey that would only rarely cross paths with other travelers. In other words, although limited to an extent by the need for resources and certain survival mechanics, players were promised an unprecedented degree of freedom and immersion. Well, needless to say, at least in its launch day form, the game was a huge disappointment. The aforementioned Jim Sterling emphasized the emptiness of the universe, its perceived lack of life, and the superficial nature of the uniqueness, alleged uniqueness of each planet. Uh, here's a longer quote. Um, I think what's, what's most important is that uh, the second part, the game's biggest fe feature that no planet is the same means very little when you, your interactions on each one are practically identical. Yes, there are dry planets, watery planets, cold planets, stormy planets, but they all adhere to the same simple rules. The major difference between a poison planet and a nuclear planet is the fact you get a different logo. The world of an average Elder Scrolls game may be far smaller than No Man's Sky's Galactic Sprawl, but it's inherently more meaningful, vivid, and lively because it actually has stuff to do and people to meet. Uh, Penny Arcade, an influential gaming-themed webcomic series, expressed a similar sentiment. Uh, I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to, <laughs> to, to, to read the strip. And uh, even critics with an overall, uh, with an overall uh, much less negative attitude struck a surprisingly similar tone. So Ben Kucha, writing for Polygon, said, for, for example, that the boredom of No Man's Sky was addictive while emphasizing that, quote, the game with everything can serve up a whole lot of nothing. As a result of this decidedly mixed reaction, the developers were to spend the next three years methodically adding new content to the game. And it's that lack of content or the lack of structure that No Man's Sky was at least initially commonly criticized for. One is tempted, however, to speak instead not of a lack of content, but a lack of meaning. And here again, an immediate caveat is necessary. Although Krakauer and others have famously described boredom as a lack or a, a lack or of or withdrawal of meaning. Uh, this is usually understood in terms of the of them meaning, uh, the meaning with, uh, let's say, capital M, something that possesses a certain value and a certain psychological heft. Uh, meaning as 
meaningfulness, if you will, or, or significance rather than signification. Whereas what happened with No Man's Sky was the withdrawal of meaning in a much more narrow technical sense, commonly associated with art and literature, meaning as that which ensures the basic autonomy of the work. Borrowing from, uh, very quickly from Nicholas's, Nicholas Brown's brilliant autonomy, the social ontology of art under capitalism, a book from uh, 2019, we could provisionally define such meaning not simply as a purpose, but a very particular kind of purpose, a purpose that is immanent to the work, rather than external to it, something that is expressed by the work or an intent that is its own, the work's own, rather than an end to which the work is simply a means. Uh, aliens uh, made up of random pieces living on planets generated by an algorithm might be used for many purposes by the player, but they have no purpose of their own. They're obviously not alive, but they also do not express anything. They do not have, they cannot have uh, immanent purposiveness. They're just they're entirely random and thus contingent to whatever it is that the game may want to mean for its plot or its mechanics or whatever else. In other words, they cannot mean anything because the very existence is by definition unintentional. Seen this way, boredom is in fact a particular form of alienation or maybe just simply loneliness. The sense that our immediate surroundings are absent of any intentional agents, any purposes that wouldn't be our own, the lack of an author. In fact, maybe we should go even further. The bottom of No Man's Sky and other similar games stems not from a simple lack of meaning, but from the fact that it withdraws meaning at the exact same moment that it makes the player a promise of meaningfulness. In other words, what is supposed to be special about the experience of a modern open world game, the freedom, the unpredictability, the unique nature of everyone's playthrough, is the exact same thing that erases the possibility of an actual meaning. The result is an outsourcing of meaning creation to the player. We are indeed creators of our own stories, but this is accompanied by the individualization of boredom or the transformation of boredom into a personal responsibility. If you're not having fun, it is you that are doing something wrong. It is up to you to entertain yourself, if you will. After all, if you bought No Man's Sky, you have literally paid to not have too much authorial supervision over your experience. This is the entire premise of the game, the whole marketing spiel. From a political point of view, what seems interesting about No Man's Sky is not just how technology facilitates such a withdrawal of meaning, but also how the idea of an open world, a meaningful universe that is entirely our own, is the next logical step in the development of the ideology of, say, free consumer choice. Whilst traditionally freedom to consume art and entertainment under capitalism was realized through a series of choices on what works to consume, what to buy, where to go, what to see, the implicit promise of modern gaming is that this freedom might at some point be realized within the structure of a game at the level of a single work rather than market in general. Of course, it's not as easy as that. One of the fundamental contradictions of capitalism is that between the owner's desire is that between the owner's desire to maximize the use value of the commodity and their desire for a sustainable demand, that is to be able to sell all the subsequent commodities as well. But at least in theory, this is where we seem to be heading. And uh, I think we'll stop here. This is about 20 minutes, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Marta Powell. Oh, wow. Uh, the first thing I thought uh, when I when I see your title was, how, how can you say this? Video games and bore, boredom, impossible. Uh, but yes, a boring video game is probably the worst thing ever in this world. <laughs> so do you have questions? For our presenters, yes, by now. All right. Uh, thank you so much for for your talk. I I was too fascinated about this in part because we're currently running experiments to see how people respond to boredom in uh, when playing Minecraft. Um, uh, I'm also a, a, an enthusiast of some of these boring games, and and I, I would suspect that Minecraft probably fulfills some of the criteria that you uh, you put out there. Um, and and it, I think it it displays an interesting um, well, difference in, in perspectives, I guess, or approaches. So, so when I look at a, a, a game that is open world or so, uh, like like Minecraft is, right? And there's these examples of people, you know, building computer, pro working computers in these environments. Then I I would suspect that people who who play them extensively probably do not feel bored, right? They would, they would evaluate these things as not boring. Yet on the other hand, you take take a sort of different perspective, sort of external to the persons playing the game saying that uh, that it is uh, at a at a more abstract level uh, 
boring, right? I, I think that's that's uh, what I understand from this. So my question is, how can these two be integrated? As a psychologist, I, when I measure boredom, I want to know, are people bored? That's it, right? Uh, uh, but it sounds that there's a different perspective where you would say, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that people are bored. There might be a more abstract uh, uh, approach to this. I just, I'm just curious what, what you think about that uh, and if I represent that uh, accurately. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Shall I, shall I start? Right. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that on a very basic level, uh, you have to have some source of meaning in a game for it to be interesting in any way whatsoever. And with Minecraft, this is especially uh, apparent in in the way people play Minecraft, so they usually well they usually either play it with friends, strangers, or they focus on the exploration of a pre-existing world, right? So you have some source of meaning. It's not the uh, let's say the authorial meaning that's put there by the developers. It's the meaning provided by the other players. So I think even on this very empirical level, uh, I don't think people may actually enjoy a game that is. Uh, indeed, in fact, devoid of meaning. I think that what, what they do is to find other sources of meaning within their games. And th th there is this very interesting process where some big publishers especially are looking for ways in which to sort of uh, sell this, uh, well, let's say, um, project the responsibilities of a storyteller onto their own players while selling this as a sort of a you know, player empowerment. This is something that's been happening, especially with Bethesda and the open world Fallout, but just many multiplayer games in general. Mm, it, it, it's just that the source of meaning shifts with games such as Minecraft rather than it is completely somehow absent. I think it's also um, that Minecraft, as opposite to the other games that we were mentioning, actually gives you tools to create something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't only tell you that you should go and create, right. but you have means by which you can create worlds so it's more like uh, i don't know blocks like like lego or something mm -hmm. than no man's sky yeah so, so so do i understand it correctly that that you would see that there's there, there to some extent there is individual meaning that people can create right uh mm -hmm. and and that there there in some games you would say there is an objective source of meaning that can be present or absent yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's true. More or less. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Something like this. You have either this very, let's say, traditional authorial meaning, or you have an environment into which various people put their own stories, their own meanings. Yeah. Anybody else? Just as a side comment here, it it sounds like uh, people like Sartre would love these games. No. It's, it's the ultimate ability to create their own own meaning. I mean, if they were alive at that point, right? It gives us some insight into in this, this issue of existentialism. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose that we have a question from Michael Gardiner about the yeah. gamification of work uh, itself. Is it inherently boring? Yeah, yes, thank you. That's that's a very uh, important question that uh, Stephen Poole, in, in this piece from, from 2008, he wrote a little bit about this. And his main idea was that uh, games are one of the ways of sort of uh, making us more, let's say, numb or more uh, apathetic towards the conditions of the labor market. That we learn uh, a that, that a certain type of tediousness may be enjoyable or, or fun through the games, and, and so later on, we uh, don't see tedious work as unpleasant. Because this is something that we start to associate it with, with a certain type of fun. So I, I'm not sure that, I, I think that gamification done well really stops the work from being boring in this very superficial sense. And this is what's terrifying about gamification. Uh, there is a potential there to make for, for a short time, I think that's important, for a short time to make certain tedious, monotonous tasks enjoyable in a way, uh, but this makes it only more insidious and, and manipulative. Uh, it's again, this th there's this uh, illusion that there is something more to work than there is, that there is something behind the tediousness of, of labor. 
So, so gamification would be a way to to hide the hide the nature of labor even more under a, a set of of superficial appearances. Yeah, but the the, the very thing that we are talking about um, similar more and more similarities to tedious work being present in games and gamification of work at the same time. Um, it, it means something, and I think it's somehow sinister. Yeah, yeah. They, they approach each other. Yeah. They more and more resemble each other from like both sides. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but yeah. It's, it's huge and open topic, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.